Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to CICD Through the Ages. Uh, today I'm going to be giving you a little bit of a history lesson on something that we maybe take for granted a little bit sometimes. A uh, little bit about me first. My name is Kat Cosgrove. Uh, that's my cat, Espresso. And I'm a developer advocate at Halloumi. But I didn't get where I am through like strictly traditional means. Uh, I did go to college, but I dropped out. And also, it wasn't for computer science. And um, ended up freelancing as a web developer, been a bartender and a teacher and an embedded Linux engineer. Um, pretty all over the place. And the advantage of that is that it allowed me to see the tech industry from some pretty weird angles. Uh, and also allowed me to have some pretty unusual struggles. But a lot of the struggles I had are typical of software engineers, regardless of how you get into this industry, whether you have a degree or not, and they aren't really being addressed. One of those issues is a lack of uh, historical context around tools like CICD. So that's why I give talks like this. Also, it's fun for people who have actually been around for a while to kind of take a stroll down memory lane sometimes. But if you want to get a hold of me later, uh, my Twitter handle is up there. You can also try emailing me at cat at palumi.com, but I would not recommend trying to send me an email. I don't, I'm not good at responding to them. So today I'm talking about CICD and how it has changed over time. Um, these days we kind of talk about CICD like it's one thing, but it's two distinct pieces, and it's older than we often like to think of it as. Um, DevOps means that we kind of sometimes think of CICD as just as new as DevOps, as of having only been around for like a decade. But as you'll see soon, it is much older than that. So just in case there are people in the room who don't know, the CI is for continuous integration, and the CD can stand for either continuous delivery or continuous deployment, which I do think is a little annoying. So continuous integration has actually been a thing since the early 90s. It hasn't always been called that, and some of the implementation has changed, but the spirit has remained the same. We merge changes to source in smaller and more frequent increments, and we make sure that the project still passes tests and builds with those changes. And we make sure that our engineers are all working from the most recent version of source, right? Do that, and you don't end up with a whole bunch of merge conflicts or surprises when it comes time to build. Simple enough. But this was first proposed a long time ago, in 1991, by a man named Grady Booch in his book, Object-Oriented Analysis and Design with Applications. Some of y'all have probably read that. I have a copy of it. Um, it's a fun piece of computer application design history. Um, the Booch method advocated for more frequent uses of classes and objects in programming in order to simplify design. But his version of continuous integration did not suggest releasing multiple times a day. In 1997, we got extreme programming, and it built on the Booch method by taking that next step and advocating for releasing multiple times a day. This kind of changed the game. It was a, a big surge in the way we develop and release software. Um, I know that the name sounds kind of ridiculous now. It gives like big 90s X Games, like product marketing, Alienware computer kind of vibes, but it didn't mean extreme in that way back then. That's just a, an artifact of the way we remember the 90s. It meant taking concepts and paradigms that were already a part of building software and taking them much further to the extreme. So thanks to extreme programming, we now have shorter release cycles. Uh, we have more extensive code review in the form of pair programming. That wasn't really a thing before extreme programming, or at least it wasn't popular. Um, acceptance testing is also like a, just a standard practice when developing software now. It, it really changed the way we think. And it was just one of the first. You know, more methodologies built on top of that. We had Scrum, we had Kanban. Agile became a thing with one goal in mind. We want to make it easier to write clearer, higher quality code, and we want to get it out to the users faster. So in the early days, while we realized that we needed to be releasing more frequently, we didn't really have tools to make that easier. It was all being done without the assistance of some kind of tooling. 
We didn't get the first open source tool to make continuous integration easier for most teams to achieve until 2001 with the release of Cruise Control. Uh, and it looks pretty primitive now. Uh, some of you have probably used it. A few of you may still be using it, but at the time it was revolutionary. Uh, fun aside, this is not the actual logo for Cruise Control. Um, I couldn't find a version of their logo with a transparent background because the PNG image format wasn't widely supported by browsers until Internet Explorer 9, which was released in uh, 2011, one year after the last update to Cruise Control. So it's, uh, it's pretty old, and I, I know I could have like, photoshopped and ripped out the background from the actual Cruise Control logo, but this is a funnier way to drive home how old this is. Um, people are still using this, by the way. Like, it's, it's not completely dead. It isn't being updated anymore, but people do still use it. Uh, anyway, it was revolutionary at the time of its release. This was the first time, at least for an open source project, that we had a system we could install and stand up ourselves to automate the management of builds, which allowed us to release way more of them. It even integrated with your IDE if you were using Eclipse, because Cruise Control was originally Java specific. If you were writing um, Ruby, for instance, you had to use the Ruby variant of Cruise Control. So that was a little bit annoying, but hey. Eventually, it was overtaken by Jenkins, which is still very widely in use today. A bunch of y'all have used it before. It supports a ton of languages, it can be made to do almost anything you want, and it has an enormous community around it. It's been around for a hot minute at this point. So when you do run into difficulties using it, it's nearly a guarantee that somebody else has run into that exact same problem and they've documented the solution. So it, that's a pretty strong point in its favor there. But it is starting to show its age a little bit. Uh, you usually have to stand up infrastructure and install it yourself, and someone has to be responsible for maintaining it. This is true to an extent, even with Jenkins X, the newer cloud native offering, which is uh, actually very cool, by the way. The cloud becomes popular eventually, and now most of us don't know how to function without it. And self-hosted, self-managed CI tools like Jenkins or the now defunct Cruise Control are kind of being replaced by these cloud services that you don't have to babysit quite as much, like Circle CI or Travis CI or GitHub Actions. They also support dozens of languages and build environments, and they know how to deal with cloud-native technologies like Docker and Kubernetes, just right out of the box. They integrate with a ton of other services and plugins to handle like analytics or observability or whatever you want. It's more flexible and lower maintenance. There is uh, an argument about the security of these things by you not being 100% in control of your CI system, but there's probably like a whole conference talk right there on the argument over whether somebody else maintaining your CI is inherently more secure than you doing it yourself. But for most people, this is a completely acceptable trade-off. So now we know how CI CD got to where it is today, but let's look at what updates looked like in practice throughout history. If you're around my age or older, I am uh, 32, you probably remember how much drama used to be involved in software updates. They were huge, they were infrequent, they took a lot of time to apply, the change logs were unreadable, and there was a like, fairly significant chance that the new version was gonna be buggy in some way that broke something else that you relied on. It was uh, a generally super inconvenient experience for everybody involved. And if you're younger than me, it might sound kind of wild to think about now, but it used to be totally normal and expected to wait like a year for a software update, or longer sometimes. Um, I can't imagine waiting that long to get a piece of software updated anymore, and I can't imagine waiting that long to release an update, and I am sure that many of you feel the same way. Even if you've done it, you're like, how can we go back to that? In a lot of situations, it wasn't even possible to just download an update. The manufacturer had to provide you with the update via some kind of like physical media, whether that meant floppy disks or CD-ROMs. Uh, this is not that long gone. 
Uh, the last time I had to do that was in 2009, updating the point of sale software for the video store I worked in. Uh, in 2009, the vendor had to mail me a USB drive. They would not email it to me because they didn't, they didn't have automated systems in place for that, but they did have automated systems in place for writing a USB drive and mailing it to a customer, I guess. So some things do still work this way. It is exceedingly rare outside of a handful of industries. It's usually like medical applications or the government. Um, I expect it to not last much longer, but you do still actually see this. Uh, phones are probably the most visceral example of how much the way we get software updates has changed. In the 90s, if you had a phone that didn't have like Snake on it or Tetris or whatever, and you wanted Snake or Tetris on your phone, there was no way to update your phone to get that game. You could not just download it. You bought a new phone. Like, you just, you just got a whole new phone, right? And eventually, phones did get better at this. Obviously, they got smarter, but updates still required plugging your phone into a computer and interacting with some proprietary piece of software from LG or Apple or whatever to apply your update. It was kind of time consuming. Uh, cloud storage wasn't ubiquitous yet, so data transfers when you upgraded to a new phone were also done via a physical cable, either by backing up your old phone to your computer and restoring it to the new phone, or for a hot second a few years ago, there was uh, phones would come packaged with a cable to plug like the old phone into the new phone and do that. And now it's something we don't think about. We don't think about this at all. When you switch phones, all of your contacts and your photos and your apps and whatever else are just there. There's some transfer time, but you don't actually have to do anything but log into your Apple account or your Google account, and it just goes for you. And the same goes for the software updates on your phone. Does anybody know um, what version the Twitter app is on your phone right now? Does anybody remember the last time you actually approved an update for an application on your phone that wasn't your phone's operating system? Yeah, we don't pay attention to it anymore. It happens automatically at this point. Uh, some people, of course, do still like force their phone to request permission for updates, but all of your phones probably just update automatically somewhere between like one and three in the morning if it's plugged in and you're not using it. And we just don't, we don't notice anymore. It's probably updating your Twitter app three or four times a week, and you have no idea. We've gone from something that takes more than a year to get an update out, and it's a whole big to-do every single time to something that we don't notice, and it happens multiple times a week, multiple times a day. We've gotten so much better at this over time, and it's truly incredible, at least to me, because I don't want to have to worry about this stuff anymore. So to wrap things up, CICD is two things. It's continuous integration and continuous deployment or continuous delivery. We just refer to them together now because one doesn't really work in context of DevOps without the other. You kind of, you need to have both pieces of the puzzle. And it's given us quite a lot. It's, it's been here for longer than we like to think about. We do like to think about it like it's about as young as DevOps, but it's not. It's almost as old as me. And it's changed a lot over the years. It's gone from an idea in a book in 1991 to multiple programming methodologies and paradigms and survived all of them. And over time, it's given us a lot of tools and concepts that we think of as integral to DevOps that wouldn't exist without CICD as a background. We didn't just get more frequent releases and not caring about what version of the Twitter app is on our phone. We also got better metrics. We got observability tools. We got tracing, a whole host of security tools that all work inside of your CI-CD system and enable those faster, cleaner releases that we don't really notice anymore, which is pretty dope. Thank you for coming to my lightning talk on a walk through the history of CI-CD.